So, as hopefully you know, it is fall time coming up. I personally keep forgetting and doing really fun summer things. Last weekend I had ice cream for breakfast and I acquired bruises all over my behind from riding double on my bicycle all the way across Toronto. It was so dangerous, but really fun. So I decided that I would write another story set in fall to kind of get my head on the game, calm myself down, remind myself to read a Dylan book every once in a while. This story, it's quite long. It's called The Sky Collector's Husband. This is part one. I haven't written part two yet, so I don't know what's going to happen. Um, but here's part one. The Sky Collector's Husband. When the Sky Collector died, it was his husband, Gary, who was left with all the skies. Sunsets crumpled in corners and slate gray storms cluttering up the empty apartment. After weeks of tripping over tattered summer days with his sadness swelling to anger at his late husband's insane hobby, Gary finally decided he had to do something with all of these used up skies. The first place Gary called was God's house. God's wife Mary answered the phone with her voice of unfiltered cigarettes and bottle caps and Gary explained the situation. There are some really nice ones here, Gary told her, untangling an oatmeal sky from the du a dusty twilight. I get that you're trying to move on, said Mary, but you humans keep having babies. They'll tell you myths about hell and purgatory when you're little so that you'll sit still in Sunday school. But here's a secret. God's a real softy. Last week I was in a round robin tennis match with Hitler and Genghis Khan. Every human gets to go to he heaven. Every single one of them. And we're overcrowded. We don't have room for every human and every sky. Gary wanted to remind her that she was once human too, but he knew better than to reason with her when she got like this. Instead, he thanked her for the lilies she sent to the sky collector's funeral and hung up. He looked at the window at the cold gray sky that would inevitably end up in his apartment. It seemed like just last week that the sky collector was alive and flipping through blue skies of endless summer days. But it was fall now, and the weather was turning cool. He went to the boiler room to turn on the furnace, and a sound like a metal train trapped in a metal cage came out. He shut everything off and tripped over a hurricane on his way out. It was always a sky collector who dealt with the furnace in the winter. Gary blew into his hands and called the local weatherman. They had met at a cocktail party some months ago and had exchanged numbers to talk about a croquet tournament Gary was organizing. At first, the weatherman seemed interested in the leftover skies. Some of these guys are real collector's items, said Gary, trying to sell it. He was sitting on the kitchen table, wrapped in a Caribbean sunset for warmth. I think I found the sky on that blue summer day, right before the July hailstorm no one saw coming. But this gave the weatherman pause. Listen, he says, thanks for the call and for thinking of me, but seeing all those rainy skies on days I promised sun, and the tornado I wasn't able to warn anyone about, I think it would break me, you know? to be surrounded by all my failures like that. And so Gary accepted the invitation to the weatherman's house for dinner later that month and hung up again, no closer to getting rid of these skies than he had been at the beginning of the day. He found another warm summer sky to wrap around himself in the chilling apartment and called the CNIB in case the blind people who couldn't see the skies wanted the opportunity to touch them instead. He called a few art galleries too, but no one was interested. Um, so that's part one of The Sky Collector's Husband. Tune in next week for part two. Thanks for watching.